All righty. G'day, everyone. My name's George, and I'm just starting as a PhD student at the University of Adelaide. And today I'm going to try and convince you to look beyond relative abundance in your microbiome study sometimes uh, by showing how intratumoral bacterial load is associated with um, mortality, prognosis, and phenotypes in, in head and neck cancer. So to begin, I've got to give a quick overview about head and neck cancer. It's a cancer of the squamous cells inside your mouth, sinus, throat, pharynx, etc. Today, I'm going to be talking about human papillomavirus negative cancers. So these are associated with um, environmental carcinogens and have a worse prognosis than uh, cancers caused by HPV. And the final little topic I want to just introduce is the concept of an epithelial mesenchymal transition. So these are when your skin cells or your epithelial cells transition to become cells that make up the connective tissue of your body, the mesenchyme. And Cancers with a high proportion of EMT tend to have a worse prognosis and metastasize. So there's been an absolute explosion, I guess, of research into cancer microbiome research over the last few years. Um, I don't want to say anything too um, specific, but I would say it's reasonably well established that most types of cancer probably have a microbiome, but in particular, cancers of the gastrointestinal tract. So that slide you can see there taken from that paper. Um, is a bunch of different cancer types and the intratumoral bacterial load for each subtype and the red box are all the gastrointestinal tract tumors with head and neck being on the very left. So in my project, I used two public data sets. Um, I used the Cancer Genome Atlas, which had four different cohorts sequenced at four different places and the CPATC data set that was uh, done a lot later in 2021. And so the benefit of that CPTAC data set is I had better proteomic data to integrate along with my methylation, RNA and whole genome data. The final piece of intro is that's the very simple calculation for bacterial load I did in this study. Every read I thought was actually in the sample um, as bacterial divided by the total reads, uh, read depth of the tumor sequencing sample that you would do for diagnostic reasons. So I didn't reinvent the wheel. This is my taxonomy pipeline. I took all the took all the reads, mapped them against the human genome, took everything that didn't map, ran Kraken and Bracken, and then I removed what I thought would be likely contaminants from the TCGA data set. Because of the four different sequencing centers, there was a lot of batch effects. So for example, in one center, Staphylococcus aureus was 30% of all the reads, and in another, it was like 0.1%. So that indicated to me it was probably a wet lab contamination problem there. So looking to the results, top line, Firstly, relative abundance, I'm absolute yet. So uh, these are the top uh, genera in both the cohorts. Interestingly, you can see there's not that many that are actually shared. The two in red, Prevotella and Treponema, were both uh, reasonably common. And another interesting fact, I guess, to point out here is Fusobacterium, which has been the most studied, I guess, cancer-associated microbe. It was barely found in one data set, but was the top bacterium in another, which I have reasons as to explain it, but obviously no, no real proof. And another thing I did just to verify to myself that some of these bacteria were actually in the tumors was I derived some metagenome assembled genomes for the TCGA data set in a bunch of the samples with really quite a lot of bacteria. And you can see a reasonably good um, relationship between the relative abundances. So um, this is a slide showing the relative abundance on the right versus the absolute abundance or bacterial load on the left. And as you can see, I've got a fat tail of tumors with very little bacteria on the right of the bacterial load graph. But then on the left, I have a bunch of tumors with a lot of bacteria. I could generate mags. The top hit was 0.5% of every read. So one in every 200 reads in that tumor sample was bacteria, which was really astonishing to me. So when I had a look at the difference between the high and the low groups, I got a survival curve like that which was pretty stunning, a massive divergence at about five, four, 500 days. Blue are, blue's the group with a lot of bacteria, yellow's the group with essentially zero bacteria. I just sort of assumed it was confounded by something like cancer stage or smoking or something obvious like that. And around a cox proportional hazard doesn't seem to be. So that made me think I'm sort of onto something here. The same approach with the CPT, uh, CPTAC data set, interestingly. I didn't quite find as much bacteria, plenty of reasons, different cohorts, et cetera, extraction, we can talk about for, for a long time. But there was a, a subset 
that maybe 10 or 20 tumors that did have quite a lot of bacteria. And I guess that difference sort of um, carried over into the survival. There was some sort of a trend here, but it wasn't as strong as what I saw on the TCG. So from there on, obviously, I have a full multiomic suite of data to sort of relate this to. I decided to have a look at some of the other data I had. For the TCGA, as I guess I introduced, the data was a bit limited. So I tried some pretty boring or old school approaches. On the plus side, they all sort of showed the same thing. Um, the bacterial load was associated with immune responses and keratinization in these tumors. Um, but the approach that I guess I just want to quickly go through with you is MOFA, factor analysis. You can think about it like a principal components, but for multiomics. So the First two principles or factors, um, I had a look at the difference with bacterial load. So purple is high bacteria, red is low, and then the two uh, quartiles in between. So you can see a reasonably strong correlation-ish, I guess, um, with the bacterial load. And when you look at the enrichment, um, sorry for the small text, all of these sort of pathways light up. Immune response, resp uh, defense response, and keratinization, and epithelial differentiation. So... With the other data set, I had a lot more data. I had matched normal data. Um, I had proteomics. And off the top, I also had some phenotypes done by the authors in the original study. And the low bacterial load patients um, were highly enriched for the more mesenchymal or proliferative subtype, which I guess pointed me in the right direction that I was possibly doing the right thing. So I um, got in contact with a friend and collaborator of mine along with their colleagues, they've developed a process to, I guess, integrate these layers of omics data. And the, it's got two steps. Firstly, you cluster the genes based on their uh, differential um, fold changes between the, the tumor and the normal. And then you run variational autoencoders to create like one integrated value for each gene within each cluster. That's the approach. Um, I don't have time and justice to do um, yeah, time to do this justice, take a photo and have a read of the paper or look at the GitHub. It's a really cool approach to, I guess, integrating multiomic data. Um, and the reason I really like this approach as sort of um, applied to this data set is it becomes really easy to do some basic statistics with covariates. And um, why I say that is, I'll just show you this example with keratinization. So um, the left plot, it, uh, clusters of all genes that have an increase in RNA expression in the tumor as opposed to the normal, but decrease at the protein level in the tumor and normal. The right hand plot is flat RNA decrease in protein. And the purple, line, uh, the purple dot is the high bacterial load group or an average, and the green dot is uh, the low bacterial load group. So you can see, for example, that keratinization, at least in this data set, seems to be perturbed at the protein downregulation level because each gene, which is each row, is consistently different in the integrated statistic uh, between the two cohorts. So just to summarize it all, have a look at absolute abundance and might tell you something cool. There's obviously a lot more work for me to do here, but um, it's provided a good launching point for this project. And um, just, yeah. Just want to thank everyone in my group, ENT Surgery Department in Adelaide, um, everyone at Flinders University, the Accelerator for Microbiome Exploration, especially Professor Rob Edwards, who gave me a lot of advice with the metagenomic aspect, and Ariane, who did all the cool multiomic integration methods. Thank you. about relative versus absolute. So I saw when you were showing one of your plots uh, with when it was bacterial load, the defined to be percent of total reads, yeah. which still sounds relative to me. So how do you get absolute? Are you spiking in something or? I'm not. Um, it's a good question. I, it's at least, I would say, a proxy for absolute abundance in the sense that because you're normalizing against the depth of the library, which is human reads, you're expecting to be human reads. Um, it at least should provide a proxy for bacterial load in that tumor. If you have 100 million reads that are 99 million of them are human, 1 million of them are bacteria, versus a sample you have 100 million reads, 99.99% uh, of them are human, 
10 of them are bacteria. And that's the sort of level of difference. So if... Have you seen studies that show that, you know, verify that with spiking data? No, I wish uh, we can. <laughs> Uh, you seek for the um, bacteria material in DNA sequencing data. Is it possible also for RNA sequencing data? And if it's possible, did you try to do so and to compare the results? I didn't. People have done it. Um, in my opinion, it has some problems because of a lot of the library preparations have poly A uh, donation. Bacteria don't have poly A in the mRNAs, so I don't trust it as much as the uh, whole genome stuff, essentially. Okay, thank you. One more. Um, um, great talk, by the way. Uh, I was wondering, uh, did I miss this? Do you have an analysis based on the site of the tumor? Because there's many sites, right? Uh, and that could impact the microbial that you observe. So, absolutely. Um, the problem that the metadata, there's 10 or 11 sites and 100 tumors, becomes a bit of like a, you're chopping up the cake too much to do reasonable statistics. Um, I did classify it based on oral versus non-oral, depending the, the ones at the back of the throat are non-oral and the ones on the lip are more oral. I included it as a um, covariate in the Cox proportional hazards and things like that. There are some differences, but I think it's outweighed by far by what I showed you with the bacterial load. Okay.